All righty, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> good to have you with us this morning. As uh, Hutch mentioned, we are on our last sixth and final week of this Fueled series. And uh, if you've got one of these workbooks with you, uh, we are on page 14 today, filling in the notes for today's message, and page 15, our video content this week for the final video is Living Beyond Myself, and the fill-in words are there on page 15. Uh, just before I get into my message for today, I've had some great feedback from different individuals and group leaders regarding uh, some of this content, and I hope it's been helpful to you, the Sunday messages, midweek groups, and the 36 devotional readings. And uh, I, I received this email what came through to our office this week from one of the ladies who started stepped out in faith. Actually, I remember her speaking to me at the vision weekend we had, our vision Friday night, saying, I'm not sure whether I should lead a group or not. And then she put her name for it. I'd like to lead a six-week fuel group. And she sent through this email this week to the office. She said yesterday, so that her group meeting was the night before, she said, I felt so let down when four of my group members messaged in, some at the 11th hour with an excuse for not being able to attend our five week, fifth week of fuel. Uh, we were down to four, including myself, but boy, did God move in the most beautiful way. People were so vulnerable as they shared some of their journeys with the group, and there were many tender moments with some tears as we encouraged and prayed for one another. The Fuel series has been empowering as we have been provided with the tools to understand our various tanks and how to go about making changes, taking responsibility, and experiencing growth along the way. So well done to that lady as well as anybody else leading a group. Thank you for doing that through the series. And we're looking forward to what God does with this content in our hearts going forward. One of the challenges in putting a series like this together is that you, there's so much to cover. In some ways, we've covered just the tip of the iceberg. And so this is not really the end of the series, but merely the end of the beginning. Because just like when you go on a walk in the mountains and you crest a little hill and suddenly uh, new valleys and mountains open up before you, when you start to engage on this kind of content of loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, you learn more and more as you grow. So for the last time on a Sunday, I'd like to show this picture uh, as part of the series. Uh, these are the four tanks we've been looking at, our physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental energy, doing our best to live in the top third of those tanks. And then we've also said along the way that these tanks are very closely joined together. They are connected. So we don't deal with them in isolation. What happens in each tank affects the other tanks as well. And uh, my hope is that you keep on paying attention to these. When I was uh, keeping track of my scores across those four tanks, when I started out eight or nine years ago, I did it for somewhere between one and two years. I don't think you can form the habits necessary within just 40, uh, 42 days, within seven weeks. I think it's something that we've got to keep practicing, keep learning, keep growing, so I encourage you to do that. My topic today is this, dealing with red zone stress, dealing with red zone stress. And I'd like to put up another picture. I invite you to draw this little graph into your notebooks if you're able to take notes. Uh, and it, it relates to how stress impacts our lives. And it's actually not all as it seems, not all stress is bad. On the y-axis, you've got performance, and on the x-axis, stress, severity, and duration. And there's three different blocks in this graph. The gray zone, I'd like to, I'll chat through them as you're busy drawing it on your page. The gray zone is where there's too little stress in our lives. Now, if you're living in the red zone, you're like, is that even a possibility? Where can I go to visit the gray zone? Well, it's actually not that good for us. In the gray zone, we become bored, dejected, sometimes depressed. It leaves us feeling purposeless and aimless. Uh, sometimes people who retire from a fulfilling work career go from the blue or red zone into the gray zone, and it, it, not, a great, not a great feeling there. I remember a friend of mine who was in our life group uh, some years back retired early, and, and every week of his first part of his retirement, he was telling us he's going this place, that place. He was doing a lot more fishing. He did some overseas trips. And after about four months, he shared with us very vulnerably. He said, these last four months have been some of the toughest of my life. He says, when your biggest aim in a day is what time you're going to go to gym, 
He says, your life feels very purposeless. And what had happened is he had ended up going into that gray zone of stress. And the soul for that is obviously to find purpose and take on some responsibility, to get active, fulfilling God's plan here on this planet. The blue zone in that graph is the healthy zone. In this zone, it's actually good stress. In this healthy zone, I've got responsibilities and purpose. I'm working effectively like God designed me to do. I'm at my most productive here when I'm living in the, in the blue zone. There's actually a technical term for this and it's called eustress, good stress. A good example of this would be a big 18-wheeler truck going along the road. If you take one of those big trucks, I'm told, and you put it on a bouncy, downhill, windy road, it can get very dangerous because the truck, the trailer bounces all over the road. It doesn't have a load on it. And the blue zone is like taking the appropriate load, putting it on the back of the truck, and the truck's wheels stick down to the gravel. Take, for example, young men, leave school, don't have much responsibility, got lots of time, don't necessarily use it that wisely, often and sometimes can cause mischief. And then you put some load on that truck. They start to study, they get, their job, get a job, they start to date a Christian girl, get married, have some kids, provide for their family, get involved in the local church, and a blue zone load lands on the truck and the wheels start sticking to the tarmac and that life becomes more productive. Any men who can attest to that journey. The red zone is the unhealthy zone of stress. Distress, we could call it. And... Back to my previous analogy, this is when the truck has got too much load on it or goes for too long without refueling and checking different parts of the engine, and eventually there are breakdowns. We weren't designed to live here. Everybody should be able to cope with short visits to the red zone, but when we stay there for too long, it's extremely damaging, it causes long-term damage to our bodies, our minds, and our emotions. This red zone is the high stress zone that doctors warn us about, and living in that zone empties all the tanks, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. Now, part of my journey, and I'm not proud of this when I look back, but I ended up not just living in the dark blue zone, but spent a lot of my time in the red zone, and I defended my reasons for being there. There was work to be done. Who else was gonna do it? It was very exciting. Uh, lots felt like it was being achieved, but I ended up not just occasionally visiting the red zone. I made my address there, and as a result, my, my health suffered tremendously. I had a full physical breakdown at the age of 28, and for the next six years was in terrible health from living too long in the red zone. And I'm not here today to just say the red zone is bad. I hopefully there's some tools on how to live in the blue zone and only occasionally visit into the red zone. What I'm sharing this morning is stuff that I've learned from other people. I'm very grateful to them for that. And there's lots of great content around on, the, on this subject. But what I'm told is that when we go into the red zone, our body produces two very important hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. And cortisol is nicknamed the stress hormone. Even in the blue zone, your body produces some cortisol, but in the red zone, there's an overproduction of cortisol. And cortisol, when it stays in our system for a long time without diminishing again, causes damage. It, these hormones, by the way, adrenaline and cortisol, were designed by God for a short-term, quick escape from a dangerous situation. It's God-given, these, these hormones. For, as an example, if you were going on a guided walk along in a, in a big five game reserve, you've been told, guys, there are lion, elephant, rhino, buffalo, etc., in this game reserve. And as you're walking along this path, you hear a sudden massive rustle in the bushes. What happens on the inside? Your pulse rate goes up, your blood pressure increases, your adrenaline is produced, and cortisol floods your system. It is preparing you to either fight, flight, or freeze. That's the danger response. It's God-given to enable you in that situation, if it's a lion, probably the best response is flight, but some of us freeze up. And interestingly, the act of running away burns up some of the cortisol and adrenaline. It, we were designed for physical activity, and it burns up the cortisol and adrenaline. But for most of us, our day-to-day -day activities are not walking in the wild, running away from lion or buffalo. We're at desks, 
or at home, at work, traveling in a vehicle somewhere, going about our day-to-day -day lives. And what's interesting about our brains is that our brain is unable to distinguish between a real physical threat, e.g. lion, and a perceived threat, e.g. a relational breakdown with another person. So my body takes on conflict, for example, or disappointment in the eyes of somebody else, or a deadline not being met, it takes it on as danger, and my body produces adrenaline, and it produces cortisol. The long-term effects of too much cortisol in our system disrupts almost all of the body's processes. It puts you at a risk of much higher, uh, at a higher risk of many health problems. This is according to the Mayo Clinic website, including increased inflammation, anxiety, digestive problems, headaches, muscle tension and pain, diabetes, heart disease, heart attack, high blood pressure and stroke. It disrupts the sleep-wake cycle. Cortisol and adrenaline, too much of it disrupts the sleep-wake cycle. It leads to weight gain, or can lead to weight gain. It's associated with problems with memory loss and focus, and it slows down the healing processes in our body. How many of us would like to sign up to live in the red zone? And yet, how many of us do more than visit there? We spend large chunks of our time, the increased adrenaline and increased cortisol. So, if that's the bad news, how do, we do, how do we handle this? How do we deal with red zone stress? What are some of the ways to break out of these patterns? I'd like to start by revisiting a verse I read in week one, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, Jesus' invitation to us. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He goes on to say his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, to put it another way in the language of today's message, I have reworded that verse like this. I'm not saying this is in the Bible, my rewording of it. Jesus might say to people like me and you, come to me, all you who are living in the red zone, filled with adrenaline and cortisol, and I will give you rest. Walk alongside me, and learn from me new ways of living in the blue zone of a productive life and a restful soul. Doesn't that sound much better? So the starting point is actually acknowledging that Jesus is willing to teach us how to go along this journey. And there's three action things we can do. These all start with an R, by the way, that when, in order to avoid living in the red zone. The first one is recognize, recognize. In other words, recognize your stress patterns, your stress triggers. What's really interesting about how God has wired us is that as soon as you dip a toe from the blue zone across into the red zone, your body will let you know somehow. God has wired us with a whole lot of signals. I did my best to just ignore them. I'm listening a lot more carefully now, not in a self-protective hide and cotton wool way, but in order to avoid massive cortisol buildup, which is what my problem was previously. And when that rustle happens in the bushes, you immediately can feel the adrenaline kick in. But not many of us notice it because we're too busy running away. But you will notice if you go through your day and something triggers cortisol or adrenaline, that threat, resp the threat response, you should be able to notice it somewhere in your body. For example, sometimes I get in my car, drive home after a day at work, and I can feel I've got elevated blood pressure. It feels like my heart's beating fast. I'm just feeling tr a little wired from adrenaline and cortisol. And I think, I didn't have that stressful a day today, I don't, I don't think. And then I'll think back. I remember that conversation I had at 10 this morning. That just started off fine and then it got, it got quite intense. I felt like that person was attacking me. I felt that it was quite personal. From then up till now, this is actually how I felt. Now that I can recognize it, I can do something about it. And so the question associated with this is, what triggered it? that I can feel my adrenaline's up or my pulse is up, what triggered that threat response? The third second R is the word respond. Work out the best short-term and long-term responses. In other words, the question to ask is, what am I going to do? Now, there's a lot that we can change. 
But there's, and I'm just gonna list a couple of them. There's a very simple short-term click out that God has given every single one of us. It, it's so simple, it will astonish you. We're gonna do it all together, is to take three deep breaths. If you have got heightened cortisol or adrenaline, child, adult, and you take three deep breaths, inhale and exhale slowly, it settles everything down. Would you like to give it a shot? Well, we're gonna do it. I invite you to do it with me. Let's take our first breath in. Second breath. Third breath. That took all of 20 seconds. And yet you should be able to feel inside of yourself that you've calmed down a little bit, whatever. Maybe I needed it more than you. But wherever it happens in a day, three deep breaths is just a quick little reset mechanism. Another reset mechanism is to ask a different question. Threat is saying, where am I in danger? A different question is, what could I be grateful for? In spite of what's been happening, I can be grateful for dot, dot, dot. The act of naming things I'm grateful for lowers my cortisol levels. Vigorous exercise, not running away from the line, but just vigorous exercise burns up cortisol. I, sometimes if I get home in the afternoons and I feel elevated response, I'll go and do something vigorous cardio wise, just because I know it's gonna settle my cortisol down, help me to sleep much better that evening. And prayer, maybe should have been first on the list. Talking to God lowers my stress and cortisol levels. And by the way, a prayer that just says, Lord, please help counts as a prayer talking to someone who's much mightier than I am. The third R, after recognize and respond, is reflect. What can I change? So this is not in the short term, respond, take three deep breaths, etc. but in the long term, I reflect back and I say, what should I be doing differently in my life? What can I change? There's a lot of things that all of us can do differently if we live in the red zone, if that's become our address or if we visit there a lot. And the interesting thing is that when we reflect in the presence of God, He reveals stuff to us and He shows us things about ourselves. I remember as, as I was going on this journey, part of this journey myself, and I was engaging with some outside people, as I mentioned, over a few years actually, just every month would stop in with one of them and have a conversation, paying attention to myself. After one of those conversations, went home and that night I fell asleep, the next morning, just before I woke up in that just REM sleep as you're coming out of your deep sleep, I felt like God speak to me very, very clearly. I don't know how to describe it except it was like a voice deep on my soul that like rocked my world. And I felt God convict me, Steve, you are a workaholic. And I had always been very critical of people that I thought overworked. Their lives just looked chaotic because they worked so much, so much, so much. And I prided myself pharisaically on not being like them because I controlled my calendar better. But I, con I felt the Holy Spirit convict me that you're a workaholic because you derive purpose and fulfillment from your work as a pastor that you should only derive from me. You have an idol in your life and you need to change. It was so intense this conversation, well, it was one way, this dialogue God was having with me, I woke up sobbing. Jax woke up next to me, said, what's wrong? And I was like, oh, I'm a workaholic. It took me about half an hour to explain, but it was so real. The problem was at eight o'clock that day, I had to get in the car and go to work. And I got on my knees before God for, for some weeks afterwards saying, how do I change my heart and my brain? I, I repent for having idols. I've been preaching against idols and here you convict me about my idols. God, I'm sorry, please help me to change. It took a long process and it's ongoing of rewiring my brain. That's what happens when I reflect in the presence of God. Why am I being in the red zone? It's because of, of wrong beliefs in my soul. There's a number of different things God has challenged me on and different habits that I've tried to change. But here's three of them that I'd like to leave with you this morning, and you might come up with many more for yourself, but the first one is this, was sit. These three have got S's, by the way. This series 
We have been saying over and over that to take 15 minutes a day to do these readings, to read your Bible is a great exercise. It's a great exercise for life because when I sit in the presence of God and reflect, He can adjust my heart and change some of the things in my world. This is a beautiful story in the Bible of Martha. It says she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what He said. At the end, Jesus commends her, well done, Mary, she's chosen what is better. Red zone people don't like sitting because adrenaline and cortisol, your brain's racing, just all that I've got to do. And yet the solve to get back into the blue zone is to sit, preferably at the feet of Jesus. The second S is the word simplify. This is a huge challenge to me, has been, and I'm sure will continue to be. Dallas Willard once called hurry, I want you to listen to this quote, if you don't mind putting it up on the screen. Dallas Willard once called hurry the great enemy of our spiritual life of spiritual life in our day, and urge followers of Jesus to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Oh, Steve, you don't understand. Maybe I don't understand your world, but I do understand mine, and when hurry becomes a way of life, it squeezes out the life of God and empties the tanks. An overly complex life, saying yes to too many different things, leads to a red zone life. Please hear this today. For most people, most of us who end up in the red zone, we make excuses and we blame somebody else. It's the fault of my children, the fault of my work. You don't understand the state of this country. It's this, it's that, it's the next thing. You don't know my spouse, etc. If you knew all the stress I was under, you wouldn't be preaching this message, Steve. One of the th- things we've emphasized over and over in this, mess, in this uh, series is the idea of personal responsibility. You cannot and will not move out of the red zone unless you take responsibility, and I take responsibility for my own life. And you see, my complex red zone life, your complex red zone life, you, you and I end up there because of a series of our small choices. And the person to do the changing is the person looking back at you in the mirror. Speaking to myself. I remember sitting with one of those people I was telling you about, and I'm like, well, you don't understand. In my job, there's just some things I have to do. Boy, she drilled me on that. She's like, who chose to become a pastor? I said, well, God called me. She said, who chose to say yes? You. You chose this job. And I say, yeah, and that's all the pressure that comes with it. She says, quit saying that. Every single thing in your calendar, you're choosing to say yes to. So I went home saying, well, she was so unfair on me. She doesn't understand. She didn't need to. She was 100% right. Who chose to have those children that are putting so much stress in my world? We did. Who chose to say yes to that job? I did. And then in the day-to-day activity, who chooses to fill my calendar with all that stuff? I choose it. And instead of using the words, I have to, when you use the words, I chose to, it changes everything. Why am I in the red zone? I chose a whole lot of things that ended me up there. Now I'm enabled to make different choices to live more in the blue zone. One of the big questions here is this, why do I do what I do? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Don't have time to dive into this in depth, but our motivation sits beneath all of our choices. I don't just choose stuff. I'm motivated by stuff underneath the surface. Some of it can be good motivation, other of it can be negative motivation, even if I'm doing good things. The third S that God has really challenged me about is this idea of Sabbath. Now, if this word's unfamiliar to you, there's a, it's the Bible idea of resting one day out of seven. In Genesis 2 verse 2, by the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Why do you think God rested? Was it because he was tired? He cannot get tired. The Bible tells us that he's all powerful. He does this because he's setting an example for all humans after that moment to be active, to be productive in six days and to rest in the one, which is also productive. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a, a one day in the week was mandated, but for us in the New Testament, I believe it could be any day in the week. What's interesting is that in the, in the Ten Commandments, alongside commandments like do not murder, 
and do not commit adultery, they were also commanded keep the Sabbath. And that was something that I consistently did not do in my journey of living in the red zone. So my day off is not a Sunday. This is match day. I love Sundays. It's not a day off. I have another day. It happens to be Fridays now in a week. But what was happening is that I would, I would work for six days. And then on my day off, my Sabbath day, I would still do some work because I think I just need to get it done in order to be ready for. Yeah, but you don't, it just has to be done. And I felt God challenged me so strongly from a story in the Old Testament where the, his people are sent out to collect manna, God's provision from the ground, this food. And they are told to collect for six, but on the seventh day they're to rest. And the food for six days, the, sorry, the food they collect for six days is enough to feed them for seven. And when they went out on the seventh day to work, God was angry with them. I felt God challenged me so much that the reason I wasn't practicing my Sabbath rest well was because of unbelief. I didn't trust God enough that work on the six days was enough to carry me in the seven. It's a beautiful story from the time of when all of the, the expansion was happening in the US and these ox covered wagons were heading out, pioneers heading out into the West, 2,000 mile journey, covering maybe 10, 15 miles a day in an ox cart. And one of these groups that headed out West was led by a guy whose name was Reverend Hines. And he had a rule for his convoy is every, sab every Sunday we rest, we don't travel. And the people were angry. They're like, how are we gonna get there on time if we, every seventh day we stop traveling? One family got so angry, they left his group and went and joined another one. As the months rolled by, the people in his group started to notice that their animals were very healthy compared to other groups that they passed. The family that left them in anger came and rejoined. Their group had fallen apart, animals had died, and that group which traveled all the days in the week was further behind than the group that rested one and traveled on six. You and I will be more productive in our God-given life and live in the blue zone if we pick a day in the week. For many, it would be a Sunday. Pick a day where we're gonna revitalize our souls in the presence of God, worshiping with others. And then not jam-pack the weekend or the, the Sunday full of all the stuff we couldn't fit in the other days. Take time to spend with family, to connect. There's chores, of course, that need to be done. But the mistake so many of us make that gets us into the red zone is we fill every day of the week with big energy draining stuff. And then after five or six weeks, we say, our tanks are empty, I have no idea why. And then we go back and see, actually it's because I didn't do my sitting, my simplifying, and my Sabbathing the way that God guided me to. Everything I'm saying today comes out of deep personal pain, journey, mistakes, and hopefully corrections to some of those mistakes. And in closing, I'd like to invite you to stand with me, please, as we make Matthew 11 part of our prayer. How many of you standing here today feel challenged by something in that message related to the red zone? So everybody who raised their hand for a little bit, we're praying this prayer together. I'm right there with you. Jesus' invitation, we did this in week one, and this is now, we're finishing off with it again. Is we're gonna be reading these words of Jesus, but making them our prayer. So I invite you to pray with your eyes open. Look at the words on the screen. As I read this out, that you make it your prayer as well. So Lord Jesus, Thank you for your invitation to come to you, Jesus. Thank you that you promise that people like us, weary, sometimes burdened, often red zone people, that you're willing to give us rest. And the way that you wanna do that is that we should take your yoke on us and we wanna learn from you. You know everything and we know such limited things and we wanna change, we wanna grow. And we know that as we do that, we'll find rest for our souls. We wanna live in that blue zone of the productive, healthy life, Sabbathing one day in the week, simplifying our lives, 
learning to sit in your presence, recognizing our adrenaline and cortisol responses and working it, keeping those down. But we're gonna do this all with our eyes on you, amazing God, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Please stay standing for the last minute as Hutch and Mel come up to land our meeting. Amazing, thank you so much, Steve. Sure, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely gonna use that uh, breathing technique more often. Um, I do just fear that my work colleagues might pass comments like, it's such okay, he's been uh, in that corner for four hours breathing. Um, but jokes aside, isn't it just refreshing to know that we have similar challenges, but that we all, all have the same um, decision-making capabilities of choice. So thank you, Steve, for a great message this morning. Perhaps you're out there and you are really feeling that you need some prayer. That's okay. That's all right. We have people that are willing to pray with you afterwards. Please come and join us in the front. It's actually such a privilege for us as brothers and sisters to pray for one another. Pray for one another. And also, uh, there's huge power in prayer as well. So please come forward if you're needing prayer afterwards. And just a reminder to our first-time visitors to please stop at one of the Connect stations for your cappuccino voucher. And for everyone else, I'd like to invite you guys just not to rush off, but just take some time to connect over um, coffee. We've got free tea and coffee in the foyer. If you prefer a cappuccino, we've got cappuccinos for sale from our coffee shop. Amazing. And last but not least, guys, thanks so much for coming out today. Have a wonderful Sunday. Be blessed. Stay breathing. And we'll see you again soon. Cheers for now. And so much stronger.